Are they? We've got about 20 minutes for some questions and some answers and a conversation, and then I'll just wrap up very, very briefly at the end. Um, John and Dave have seen the best of the UK in the kind of three, four days of the game. I hope they don't see the worst of the UK, which is everyone at meetings like this going, I'm not asking a question. <laughs> So do feel free to put up your hand. We'll take perhaps one or two at a time. If anyone would like to start us off, then do so. What do you do with information? <coughs> the introduction that family you never met some single people. And there's a lot of single people who need somewhere to live. Oh, yes. Young people. And you didn't make any mention of accommodations. And it's a problem here, but that is a serious problem. Good, well, thank you. That's an omission. You asked about, well, what about single people? And I'm assuming you're not just talking about the elders, you're talking about uh, young people and students, students at various time. Uh, we actually have a lot of one-room apartments that we make available to young people, um, even to you know a single mom with a young child before the child needs a, a separate room. We make available one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedrooms, a few, four, but not too many. But we try. One, we've tried to create a diversity of types of housing to accommodate different people with different needs, particularly in their family life cycle. But we've also tried to create a diversity of tenures so people can move from one form of tenure to another, you know, from rental to home ownership and back and forth. So we try to have mobility within our system, but also when people are ready to leave, we encourage and reward them to jump into the market. Okay, just ask one more if you don't mind. Uh, you mentioned Lexworth and Wellington Garden Cities. Now, my personal view, when I mean visited Lexworth at something, was they were run, they were like dictatorships yes. by employers. Yes. And there were very restrictive conditions yes. on living there. Yes. I mean, like, when I went to Lexworth, I was amazed that everybody was getting dressed and disappearing. That's what I got to, he said. Some town. I said, what's that? He said, pulse. They wanted a single pull. Yes. Now, that was the kind of restricting this, yes. that they were dictated to by the factory owners who built the house even on the land. It wasn't. It was, a, it was a land trust, it was not a community land trust. No, no, no. It was a group, as Ebenezer Howard described them, men of probity that would issue the stock and control the corporation. You're exactly right. Yeah, so what happened to that now? I mean, I'm going back 50 years, I can't see it happening like that now. What, what you... Well, they are negative lessons of what not to do, I believe. I think the, <coughs> with our experience, in coming out of the civil rights movement is that you had to create a different governance structure and a different participatory involvement of the community to avoid the company town mentality and reality. Yeah. So we tried, our experience so far has not been the Letchworth experience, but <laughs> when it happen, it might happen. Constant vigilance, constant organizing is the only protection against that, except for the fact that this tripartite board is remarkably stable. No one interest group has enough power under themselves to move the corporation without convincing people from the other voting blocks to go with them. We've had 14 CLTs fail since 1969. That was one of my questions. Yes. yes. And in those cases, the people who were living on the, the land were not harmed. We made right. provision for them. Thank you. Give us much. Yeah, and my question is a similar one. I, I can't understand, except for it's uh, explained very well the history of it, why you split the land ownership uh, from the people who are living there. Yes. That seems to me that you're, although you've got the three in um, board, but you're actually setting up the possibility of the people who are living there being told what to do by the board. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, my second question leads into that is about size. And I know that might seem trivial, but someone who's involved in the same co-op at the moment, yes. um, we're very concerned to keep it small and feel that that's the way to keep it democratic and power in the hands of the people um, who are involved. And seeing this big, of course you can do more, and but, you know, we're only going to have to be. Or you can stay small. Yeah. Probably have two-thirds of the community land trust in the United States have a staff less than three. Yeah. 
right? And they have made the decision that their community is a small, localist community, and they're going to serve that one neighborhood, that one village, and they're not going to go outside the boundaries. This is a decision. It's a political decision made by the community. Do you want to speak to that? And I'll speak to the first question. Uh, want to speak to the size question? Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we only have, uh, we started with maybe four board members, and we're up to seven. And um, we serve Sonoma County, and that's not very big, and we're only in three cities. And so we have grown slowly, deliberately, because we want to do it well, and working with the community. And so you absolutely, because it's a community organization, the decision of how fast to grow, how big, uh, what type of you know, housing to provide um, is definitely up to the community. And um, as far as control, if I'm not trying to that one first How much do you interfere with the lives of your home? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, we are there so that if they need someone to call, they can call someone that they can trust because we've proven that we have their best interest at heart. And so we are the vehicle to make the call to the lender or an attorney or whatever it is that they need, but we know we're gonna find someone who's not predatory. All right. So we are, in fact, one of the things we say in our call on our meeting is, the land is leased, and the reason it's leased is because it reduces the cost of acquiring the entire property. Because, uh, for example, the homes that we have the market value is five hundred fifty thousand dollars. The two hundred and fifty thousand was the dirt, right? Because it's just a very expensive place to live. Sonoma County, come visit. I'll take you out. My country is beautiful, but you can't possibly afford if you're a teacher like I am. It still am and used to be to live there. So um, when you take the cost of the land out and you say. You can lease it for $10 or $55 or whatever it is you decide, but you have exclusive rights to it. Every lot or plot, I guess you would say here, has its own parcel number. And the only people that have rights to that parcel is the home. So your house or your property sits on top of that land, and no one, I can't go picnic on anybody's land, the neighbors can't go, and I say this, I can't go picnic on your land. I also not pulling your weeds, that is not the kind of leasing this is. This is simply an economic mechanism to get around the problem of the insane market and to make it affordable by reducing the cost of the land. And then you own a house permanently, you know, 100%, and you are completely responsible for taking care of that property. And we actually, this is not your typical landlord tenant agreement where no. all, all the rights and powers are reserved for the landlord. This is a very finely balanced document where um, the homeowner uh, is protected against the incursion, the, the overreaching of the landlord uh, by the ground lease. There's many protections in there for the homeowners, there are for the landlord. For the most part, community land trusts are silent partners in the deal. You know, we, you know, we own the land, we never interfere with your right of association. We never interfere with what you want to do inside your house. Uh, things like this, right? You can you can stay there forever, you can bequeath it to your kids, or you can sell it after three years, five years, 20 years, whatever you want. All we really care about is that when it comes time for you to resell, you're gonna sell it for a price that is designed to keep it affordable for the next low income or moderate income family who wants to get in that same good deal. In the United States, the surest way, legally defensible, durable way, to exert that right to restrict the price is through by building it into the ground lease. It's a, a, a legal mechanism. Yes. We also collect a lease fee. We ask the homeowner to pay a lease fee. It could be ten dollars a month, five dollars a month, twenty-five. Uh, I mean, CLTs do it different ways. But even if it's only a dollar a month, the advantage to that to the land trust is that it's an early warning system for us. Because if that home buyer, that homeowner gets in trouble, what's the first thing you're going to stop paying? It's going to be their ground lease fee. The, the, this benevolent nonprofit owner of the land. You pay your cable, you pay your car, you pay your kids' education, you pay your mortgage, you, you, you stick the CLT. The CLT, then the little bell goes off, and we step in and we say, you know, you're in trouble. Are you also defaulting on your mortgage? 
I think we know that because we also build in 